Hi, I'm David Barish. I am the president of Connection Point and Crowdfunder. We are at crowdfunder.com on Twitter and Tumblr and Facebook. We are Crowdfunder and Crowdfunder underscore on Instagram. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to Rapid Fire. The concept of Rapid Fire is simple. 11 questions, 9 to 15 minutes for the interview itself. And we get to talk with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. Our guest today is an entrepreneur. He is, of course, the face and the CEO of Connection Point. Of course, the creator of Crowdfunder without the E. And we are joined by the ever-talented David Barak. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Kurt, thanks so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. It's, it's nice to have you on. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm David Barish, as you mentioned. I'm the president of Connection Point and Crowdfunder. And as a creative person, I went to uh, Tel Aviv University and studied film there, specifically screenwriting. And then I went to Johns Hopkins University and studied fiction writing. So I've written quite a bit, but I never really published any of my work or produced any of my work. As I was going through grad school, I became interested in online fundraising, specifically for nonprofits. The entrepreneurial bug bit me. Subsequently, I started a company and sold it. And I started another company and I sold that one. In the past few years, I've been working on Connection Point to advance the Connection Point fundraising platforms. Connection Point has three of them right now, one on the way. They are Fundraiser for Social Good, Crowdfunder for Creators, and Cocoa Pay for helping people that are struggling with their healthcare bills. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being an entrepreneur? entrepreneur. Well, I think that people think that it's kind of glamorous. It's not. It's really hard work. You have to be really dedicated and really committed to it and feel pretty strongly and passionately about the thing that you want to produce. Generally, most of the people that are entrepreneurs, whether they are opening a restaurant or whether they're opening up online platforms like I did, they really are passionate about serving people that thing that they're going to be producing or that thing that they're going to be creating for them. But what that means, you really have to uh, have a strong belief that what you're doing is something that, that will benefit people and be meaningful in their lives. Because I've, I've <laughs> known a couple of entrepreneurs in, in my life. You never really can pick their brains too often because they're always off doing something crazy and, and amazing and, and cool. Yeah, uh, it's certainly been my experience with the entrepreneurs that I've encountered in my journeys too. Well, let's talk about Crowdfunder itself because creative people are horrible when it comes to promoting themselves, usually, for the most part, I should say. They're getting better with social media. And then crowdfunding, of course, is a, a way to get their products out there to the masses. How is Crowdfunder different compared to, say, a Kickstarter or any other platform that is out there? That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it because when we set out to do Crowdfunder, we didn't want to do just another clone of other platforms that are out there. We really wanted to do this differently. And coming from Fundraiser, where our focus was on impact and social good, we wanted to come into helping creators and the arts specifically as a social good company to give creators the ability to do things their way, not things the way that the platform needs in order to, to support its specific business model. So there are four ways that Crowdfunder is different. The first is it's free. That's right. We don't charge you. We have a couple of different models of pricing models that you can choose from. One of them is 100% free to you. You do still have to pay payment processing, um, but we don't charge you anything. The way we make money is we ask your supporters for tips. And if they tip us, then we get paid. And if they don't, then we don't. But we've been doing this for 12 years at Connection Point, even though Crowdfunder is only six months old. Connection Point's been around for over 12 years. We know the dynamics there. We know that we're able to get paid. So that's one model that's completely free. The next model, nearly free, we ask your supporters to cover your costs. And generally they do. And what that does is it brings the cost of crowdfunding at minimum below 2% and uh, oftentimes even below 1%. And so if you compare that to the cost of crowdfunding with other platforms where it's between 9 and 10%, it's significantly better for creators. Their total cost of crowdfunding to be around 2% lower, 1% to 2% lower than credit card fees. Very, very cost-effective way to do it. The second thing is that Crowdfunder is flexible. It is really designed to support the way that creators want to connect with their supporters and not in a way that protects us, the platform, right? And so, for example, we allow for both keep it all 
and all or nothing campaigns. The creator gets to choose. So for example, if you've already produced all of the assets and you're just using this as a way of generating buzz or determining uh, pre-order numbers, then you can run a keep it all campaign and the funds come to you immediately because we don't hold the funds at all. All the funds go directly to the creator themselves. We don't touch them, we don't hold them. Also with us, there are no tiers. So basically you put in the rewards that you wanna offer. The supporters can pick whichever ones they want. They don't have to pick just one tier and then possibly some add-ons afterwards, but they're not forced into a certain tier and therefore they have the flexibility to order a variety of different items from you. And we've seen that that actually increases the amount of items that people will select because they're able to make their own choices and not be forced into a specific tier. We also allow creators to run concurrent campaigns. So that means more than one campaign at once. By running more campaigns over the course of a year, you're able to connect more often with your audience and not have to wait for one campaign to be completely fulfilled before you start another. We know that creators are creating all the time. They're constantly coming up with new things that they want to produce. There's no reason for them to have to wait. The only reasons why other platforms do that is again, to protect their own interests. I guess another way that we make it more flexible to support your business is that we allow you when your campaign ends to actually roll it over into a store. So all of the promotion that you've done, and like you said, Kurt, you know, it's very hard for creators to self promote. So if you've already gone through all of that and you've already done all the promotion, you should have that link live on if you want to, to be able to continue using that to fund. Number one was free. Two, it's flexible. Number three is we have something called Crowdfunder Professional, which does not exist in other platforms, but what it does, there's an extra level of features and more advanced functionality for those that are either capable and interested in more features that allow them to set up their own branding. You can replace the Crowdfunder branding, put in your own logo, your own colors, your own navigation menu with whatever uh, links you want in there. It's almost like a takeover with your own brand of your crowdfunder campaign. It's about connecting you with your supporter not connecting your supporter with the platform. There are advanced roles and permissions in there where if let's say you're a publisher, you can invite different members of your team with different permissions. And then you can also invite the creators that you're working with to work on their campaigns, just their campaigns at the permission level that you want them to be in there so that they can help you, the publisher, promote. Finally, you can get a verified badge it's a blue tick, it does not cost $8. There are certain additional privileges that come with that that help you do it. All those things with Crowdfunder Professional where we put your brand first leads me into point number four, which is we're trying to help the creators build their audience directly. Similar to the way that with Shopify, if you have a Shopify account and you're paying Shopify to have that account, you can have a direct to consumer store and direct sales relationship with your customers and they become your customers. You can contact them in any way that you want, of course, compliant with fan laws, but, and they remain your customers forever. They do not become our customers. They're not crowdfunders customers. They are yours. And that's very different than the other platforms. The other platforms are a little bit more like Amazon, where the customer belongs to the platform. You think about all the people that have Amazon Prime as an example, but the customer belongs to the platform and they are paying the platform. And then the platform pays their suppliers. Amazon pays their suppliers. So with other crowdfunding platforms, the creator is essentially a supplier to that platform because the customer is not paying them directly. The customer is paying the platform. The platform is paying them. The platform owns that customer relationship, which is not the way we do it. We want the creator to own the customer relationship. The four ways the crowdfunder is different is first, it's free. Secondly, it has a much greater degree of flexibility so that a creator can run their campaign their way, the way they want to do business, not the way the platform does. Third is Crowdfunder Professional, which has a more advanced feature set, also allows the creator or a publisher to take over the brand and put their brand first, their logo, their colors, and to work with a more expanded team, including inviting creators in that can manage their own campaigns with those permissions. Number four is that our platform is a little bit more like Shopify and that the campaigns have a direct relationship with their support supporters versus other platforms that act more like retailers, like Amazon, where the supporters, they're paying the platform and therefore they are the platform's customers, not the creator's customers. And the creator essentially takes on the role of a supplier to the platform. So there's an intermediary there, essentially disintermediates the relationship between the creator and their supporters. 
everyone usually asks, what, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received, especially as an entrepreneur? I'm sure you received a lot in, in your many years of doing this. But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your journey? I think the second wisest piece of advice that I ever got was from a former business partner of mine. Her name is Laura Kittleman Yates. What she said to me is, we can talk about doing things or we can actually get to work and do things. That was her kind of way of saying there's a point where uh, too much talk just does gets in the way of actually getting things done. Yeah. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> that, that was good. I, I heard, I've heard similar versions of it just with no swearing. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> What do creative people face in terms of crowdfunding that you've seen in your many years of doing this? I think the hardest thing and you mentioned this earlier, that the hardest thing, it's really hard to put yourself out. It's, it's scary, right? I mean, you've created something, you're proud of it. This is almost the first time that that particular item is going to be in the public eye. There's a certain fear of, you know, people won't like it, people won't be interested, no one's going to want to see it. And so it takes a certain amount of courage to put your work out there. More experienced creators as time goes on, they overcome that just by virtue of having done it, you know, enough times that they're a little more immune to it. But that's a really, I think, a really daunting thing that certainly starting creators face. But promotion is really the hardest part of crowdfunding. You've got to drive people over to discover what you're doing. And creators, not necessarily promoters, right? That's a certain talent and a certain skill set. It's expensive to hire people to do that for you. You've got to try and figure it out and find a way to do it. In Crowdfunder, we have uh, our creator hub and there is a toolkit in there that helps people with ideas around promotion and how they can do that better. But I really think that is uh, that's probably the hardest thing that people encounter. You know, being a successful entrepreneur that you have, everyone has kind of that dream job that they've always wanted to do. But if you couldn't do what you're currently doing, what would you have liked to have done? Uh, that's, that is a super fun question. I mentioned earlier, I studied screenwriting and fiction writing. The notion of writing is something that's really compelling to, and that I did not end up having an opportunity to do. If you take fiction writing and you think about it, about, you know, comic books, it's visual storytelling. It's obviously not the same, but it does have some similarities with what you would see in screenwriting. And I did not want to go into the film industry. That's not really an environment that I think I would thrive in. But if I were not doing this, I think I'd want to be a comic book writer. Why can't you do that now? I can. And I think I will. Good. 2024. Yeah. 2020. Well, maybe even 2023. Okay. Challenge challenge accepted. Is that first <laughs> exclusive? On, I suppose uh, that is a first exclusive. Yeah. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? So I, I think back to a really early experience. This was when I was a, a really little kid. And this is not written language. This is spoken language primarily. Some of my earliest memories are waking up in the middle of the night, having nightmares about the Nazis coming and taking my family away. So I was born 25 years after the end of World War II. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors. That was something that my family talked about a lot. You could say our intergenerational trauma. The fact that the stories about what happened during uh, World War II and the Holocaust were so powerful for me. Until today, I still remember that I used to wake up uh, as a little boy having nightmares about the Nazis coming and taking my family away. Yeah, it's something that a lot of us can't um, fathom to this day. Yeah. It's, it's a, still a tragedy after all this time. From a script writer's perspective or from a reader of comics, was there a comic that made you feel that, you know, if you were to get into this industry, you yeah. wanted your work to reflect? So I read a comic recently. It's called That Distant Fire. Uh, it's by J.R. Hudo and Kurt Merlo, and it was published by Black Eye Books. The book itself, the illustration of it was stunningly beautiful, I thought. But the story, it was aching tragic, right? There was something about it that this really powerful sense of humanity and struggle that these characters were going through, that you could really feel it. There was something really engaging about that. It was just, you know, hauntingly beautiful in that regard. I'd highly recommend it. And if I can evoke those kinds of feelings in people in, in my writing, I would absolutely want to be able to do that. It's amazing that you bring up that we had J.R. Hudo on the show actually last year to talk oh, about that. It was such, such a beautiful book in so many ways. 
Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I'd say that have to be my father. He really taught me right from wrong. He taught me about how honesty is the absolute number one most important thing. And he led by example in everything that he did. He was honest. He was respectful. He was very kind. He was definitely my dad who inspired me most. From a professional standpoint, you're an extremely successful entrepreneur. You've created an amazing crowdfunding platform with Crowdfunder, you. and you've done many amazing things that we haven't had time to talk about, at least in this interview. So I can't wait to see what you do in the future. Professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I do. In, in many ways, I set out to accomplish what I wanted to do, and I am doing that, and I'm doing pretty well at it. I have a great family. I have a, a good set of close friends. You know, maybe the one thing where I could probably do better, take better care of my health. A lot of people really? feel that way, you know, a little bit more exercise, uh, a little bit more attention to that sort of stuff. But otherwise, um, yes, I do think I do consider myself to be personally successful. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? Chocolate. <laughs> I have my chocolate, makes me feel a little bit better, you know, that endorphin rush. And then I, you got to get back to work. I mean, that's the best way to deal with failures is you just got to, you got to get back to work. You got to keep going, take that next step. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired but creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or a script writer, or maybe you've created the new set of entrepreneurs based off of what they've succeeded with, with crowdfunding. They'll have to inspire the generation that follows them. So how mm -hmm. can they do that? Well, the best way to do that really is to be authentic. You need to be yourself. Uh, you need to be kind. Kindness is the one thing that doesn't cost you anything and, and it makes a big difference in other people's lives. And I also think it's really important to be generous with your knowledge. The more generous you are with your knowledge, the more the future generations are able to build off of that and learn off of that. The entire advancement of human society is built on that sharing of knowledge and disseminating it as broadly as you possibly can. So if you do have something to share, Absolutely share it. If your life was a film or a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Ooh, that's a tough one. Its title would be, why don't you ever finish anything? Would you like me to explain that? Yeah, yeah. now I'm curious because this sounds like you're attacking me in my life right now. <laughs> This was something that my mom said to me when I was a teenager, because I had so many broad interests that I would pursue something, gain a certain level of mastery. I don't know if mastery is the right word, but I'd gain a certain level of confidence with that, whatever that thing was. And then I was done. I was ready to move on to the next thing. You know, she thought that that bouncing around showed a, a lack of focus. And she kept saying to me, why don't you ever finish anything? That was that. And then as far as the soundtrack goes, I don't know. I mean, just the idea of bouncing around makes me think of one of those um, uh, Keystone Cop movies soundtracks where, you know, you know, dee, 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 the music's playing too quickly or something like that. Mm -hmm. Everybody, oh, yeah. And the truth is, I don't know why. I'm not a frenetic person. Like I'm pretty calm and in some ways kind of gradually step through things in my life. You put me on the spot and that's what came out. <laughs> Well, David, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find all of your amazing work on the internet? Certainly, I would say uh, check out crowdfunder.com. That's where you can find what is currently my creation, the thing that I'm the most proud of right now. You can also follow Crowdfunder on Twitter at Crowdfunder, Tumblr at Crowdfunder and crowdfunder underscore on Instagram. And then me personally, I am at Barash on Twitter. That's my last name, B-A-R-A-C-H. Uh, that's where you can find my posts. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I am only one person. And it is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And of course, the podcast is finally back up and running after a nice... 12 year hiatus thanks to it being all deleted off the internet to geeks talking dot dot com but of course you can find it on all of the other streaming services like spotify and iHeartRadio and all that as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on to geeks talking